Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. I was always curious about the world beyond my borders. And by the time I finished high school, I had a decent grasp of global events, including major historical moments like the Cold War. When I landed a job at an international company in a diverse country, I was thrilled. It was a chance to work alongside people from all corners of the globe, to learn about their cultures firsthand. I threw myself into my work, eager to prove myself and make connections with my colleagues. One Friday evening, a co-worker hosted a house party. The room was buzzing with conversation. I was chatting with a group when I overheard someone mention Sputnik. Intrigued, I turned to the speaker. I politely interrupted to ask about Sputnik, admitting I hadn't heard of it before. The moment those words left my mouth, I knew I'd made a mistake. His eyes widened, and a smirk spread across his face. My colleague expressed shock at my lack of knowledge about Sputnik. His voice was loud enough to draw attention from nearby groups. I felt my cheeks flush as he continued. He then made a sweeping generalization about Latinos being self-centered and only studying their own country. He even questioned if I knew about the Cold War. The condescension in his voice was unmistakable. I tried to explain myself to salvage the situation. I attempted to clarify that I had indeed studied the Cold War and that Latino education tends to be quite Eurocentric. I admitted that I simply didn't know that Sputnik was the name of the first satellite in the space race, but he wasn't listening. He'd already turned away laughing with the others about my perceived ignorance. I spent the rest of the party feeling small and embarrassed. A week later, I decided to confront him privately. I caught him in the break room at work. I tried to initiate a conversation about what had happened at the party, expressing my discomfort with his comment and explaining that it was unfair and based on assumptions. His response was dismissive. He suggested that I should just admit to not knowing about politics. His tone stung and I walked away feeling frustrated and unheard. For the next year, I kept my distance from him. I focused on my work and building relationships with my other colleagues. I even started a book club where we discussed global literature and history. It was my way of proving to myself that I was knowledgeable and curious about the world. Then came another house party. This time we were playing a mime game. The person miming was Russian, and in a moment of playfulness, I started guessing using every Russian word I knew. I called out glasnost and perestroika. To my surprise, the colleague looked confused and asked what those words meant. The perfect opportunity for comeuppance had landed in my lap. I took a deep breath, channeling all the frustration from that night a year ago. I mimicked his earlier behavior, expressing shock that he didn't know what glasnost and perestroika were. I made a sweeping generalization about his people being self-centered and questioned if he even knew about the Cold War. The room fell silent. I saw the shock and embarrassment on his face, mirroring how I must have looked a year ago. But this time I didn't feel small. I felt vindicated. He accused me of being a bad person and holding a grudge for no reason. I shrugged, not bothering to hide my satisfied smile. I suggested that perhaps next time he'd think twice before making assumptions about someone's knowledge or background. The party resumed, but there was a new tension in the air. Some people were hiding smiles while others looked uncomfortable. It wasn't just about getting even, it was about standing up for myself and challenging stereotypes. Then I noticed a change in the office dynamics. The colleague kept his distance, but others started approaching me more often engaging in discussions about global affairs and cultural exchanges. My daughter got into a terrible accident. She was riding her bike when a car ran a red light and hit her. The doctors said she was lucky to be alive, but her knee was severely damaged. She needed multiple surgeries and months of physical therapy. As a single parent, it was tough. I had to juggle work, hospital visits, and taking care of my daughter. But we managed. After three months, she was finally well enough to return to school. The doctors had warned us that her knee was still fragile and covered it with special medical bandages. 
On her first day back, I dropped her off at school. I spoke to the principal, explaining my daughter's condition and the importance of the bandages. He assured me everything would be fine. But everything was not fine. I got a call from the school nurse just two hours later. The nurse urgently told me to come to the school immediately, saying there had been an incident with my daughter. I rushed to the school, fearing the worst. When I arrived, I found my daughter crying in the nurse's office, her knees swollen and red. I asked her what happened. Between sobs, my daughter explained that the gym teacher didn't believe her about her knee. She said the teacher accused her of faking it to get out of class and then grabbed her leg and ripped off the bandages. I was furious. How could anyone do this to a child? I demanded to see the principal and the gym teacher immediately. In the principal's office, the gym teacher stood there, arms crossed, looking annoyed. She defended her actions, saying she'd seen plenty of kids try to get out of gym class. She claimed my daughter seemed fine walking to school and thought she was just making excuses. I angrily reminded her that my daughter had surgery and that I had informed the school about her condition. The principal confirmed they had received that information and asked the teacher why she didn't check with the office first. The gym teacher dismissively replied that she didn't have time to verify every student's story and insisted that if my daughter was really injured, she should have brought a note. I pointed out that a note shouldn't have been necessary since the school was already informed. I then questioned what gave her the right to put her hands on my child and remove medical bandages. The gym teacher just shrugged, showing no remorse. That's when I knew I had to take action. This wasn't just about my daughter anymore. What if this teacher did something like this to another child? I left the school and went straight to a lawyer's office. After hearing my story, he agreed to take the case. We sued the teacher and the school district for $1 million for negligence, assault, and emotional distress. The case went to court. It was a long and stressful process, but I was determined to see it through. My daughter had to testify, reliving that horrible day. But she was brave, telling the court exactly what happened. The defense tried to paint the teacher as a dedicated educator who made a mistake. But their argument fell apart when other students came forward with similar stories of the teacher's rough behavior. Finally, after weeks of testimony, the jury reached a verdict. They found in our favor, awarding us the full $1 million. The gym teacher's face turned pale when she heard the verdict. After the trial, the school board announced that the gym teacher had been fired. They also implemented new training programs for all staff on how to handle students with medical conditions. We used part of the money to cover my daughter's medical expenses and set up a college fund for her. The rest, we donated to a charity that helps children with disabilities participate in sports. It wasn't an easy journey, but standing up for what's right never is. My daughter's knee eventually healed and she even joined the swim team. Last I heard, the gym teacher was working at a fast food restaurant now. Let me tell you about the time I had to deal with the neighbor from hell. I just moved into my first house after years of hard work and saving. It was a modest place on a corner lot, but it was mine. I was excited to have my own yard and garden. Little did I know my dream was about to turn into a nightmare. It started small. I'd notice dog poop in my yard every now and then. At first, I thought it might be strays or maybe someone walking their dog and not cleaning up. But it kept happening more and more frequently. That's when I realized it was my next door neighbor's dog. This woman would just open her door, let her dog out without a leash, and then yell for it to come back inside when it was done. Never once did she pick up after it. My beautiful yard was turning into a minefield of dog crap. I tried to be neighborly about it. I went over to talk to her, thinking maybe she just didn't realize what was happening. I politely approached her about her dog using my yard as a bathroom and asked if she could clean up after it. She flatly denied it was her dog. When I insisted that I had seen her dog doing it multiple times, she stubbornly maintained that I must be mistaken and that her dog doesn't do that. This went on for weeks. Every time I tried to talk to her, she'd deny it or slam the door in my face. The last time I knocked on her door, things got really heated. I told her I'd had enough and asked her to keep her dog off my property and clean up after it. 
She angrily repeated that it wasn't her dog and threatened to mace me if I didn't leave her alone. That was the last straw. I'd tried being nice, I'd tried reasoning with her, and now she was threatening me. It was time for some payback. One early morning, while it was still dark, I put my plan into action. I grabbed a spray bottle filled with water and snuck out to her car. I misted her windshield lightly, then sprinkled dust all over it. Then came the pièce de résistance. I used the newspaper from her porch to pick up some of the dog turds from my yard and line them up on her windshield wipers. I waited, hidden, to watch the show. She came out, got in her car, and turned on the windshield washers. Oh boy, what a sight. The wipers smeared dog crap all over her windshield. The washer fluid just made it worse, creating a disgusting, greasy mess. The smell hit her hard. She jumped out of the car and started puking all over her driveway. She was on her knees, heaving and retching. After a while, she stumbled back inside and came out with cleaning supplies. She spent the next hour trying to clean the mess, gagging the whole time. But I wasn't done yet. Remember that newspaper I used to pick up the turds? I rolled it back up, put it in its sleeve, and left it on her porch. Later that day, when she came home from work, she picked it up and took it inside. A few minutes later, I heard more puking noises coming from her house. Since then, she's been walking her dog on a leash. She still doesn't pick up after it, but at least she avoids my yard like the plague. I guess you can't win them all, but I'd say I won this round. These days, my yard is poop-free and I can enjoy my garden in peace. I'm 30 years old and I've been married to my husband for five years now. We met in college. Both of us were studying business and we hit it off right away. He was charming, ambitious, and we shared the same dreams of building a successful career and starting a family. After graduation, we both landed good jobs at different companies. We dated for a couple of years, got engaged, and had a beautiful wedding surrounded by our friends and family. Everything seemed perfect. We bought a house in the suburbs, worked hard at our jobs, and enjoyed our weekends traveling or hanging out with friends. When I got pregnant, we were over the moon. We had always wanted kids, and now it was finally happening. Our son was born, and he was the most beautiful baby I'd ever seen. Those first few months were tough with the lack of sleep and adjusting to being parents, but we were happy. As our son grew older, we started noticing that he wasn't hitting some of the typical milestones. He didn't babble much, rarely made eye contact, and seemed to get overwhelmed easily by noises or changes in his routine. At first, we brushed it off, thinking all kids develop differently. But when he turned three and the differences became more pronounced, we decided to see a specialist. That's when we got the diagnosis. Our son has autism. It was a shock to say the least. We had to adjust our expectations and learn how to best support him. I threw myself into researching, finding therapies, and adapting our home to make it more comfortable for him. My husband. Well, he seemed to withdraw a bit. I thought he was just processing things in his own way. Fast forward to now and that brings me to what happened last week. I was at home tidying up the living room while my son was at his occupational therapy session. My husband had some friends over in the backyard, having a few beers and catching up. I could hear their voices through the open window, but I wasn't really paying attention until I heard my husband's voice get louder. One of his friends remarked on how tough it is to raise kids, wondering how we manage it. My husband responded that we had it hard, saying he sometimes felt overwhelmed. When his friend tried to reassure him, my husband insisted that our situation was different. He went on to describe our son as being too much to handle and feeling like a burden. I froze, unable to believe what I was hearing. But it got worse. My husband then admitted that there were days when he wished we could give our son up for adoption. His other friend expressed shock at this statement. My husband acknowledged it was extreme but continued to say, he missed our old life and sometimes thought everyone would be better off if we weren't stuck with our current situation. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. How could he say those things about our son? Our beautiful, sweet boy who just sees the world differently. I was shaking with anger and hurt. When his friends left, I confronted him. I asked how he could say such things about our son. He pretended not to know what I was talking about. 
I told him I had overheard his conversation repeating the hurtful things he'd said. He tried to brush it off saying I was overreacting and that he was just venting. I couldn't believe he thought I was overreacting to talk of abandoning our child. He tried to explain that he was overwhelmed, saying our son's autism was taking over our lives. When I pointed out that running away wasn't the solution, he insisted I didn't understand the complexity of the situation. I argued back, reminding him that our son needs us and questioning how he could even think about giving up. He weakly said he didn't mean it like that and that he was just tired. I countered that we were both tired, but I would never consider abandoning our child. I asked how I could trust him to be there for us if this was how he really felt. He tried to end the conversation saying I was blowing things out of proportion, but I couldn't let it go. How could I? The man I thought I knew, the man I married and had a child with, was talking about our son like he was a burden, a mistake. It made me question everything. I spent the next few days in a daze going through the motions of our daily routine while my mind raced. I watched my husband interact with our son, looking for signs of resentment or discomfort. Sometimes I caught a flicker of frustration in his eyes, but he tried to hide it. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I sat him down after we put our son to bed. I insisted we needed to talk about what he had said. He tried to brush it off again, saying he didn't mean it and asking if we could move on. I told him that we couldn't, explaining that this wasn't something I could just forget. I asked if he understood how his words made me feel. He tried to downplay it as just venting, acknowledging that parenting was hard sometimes. I agreed it was difficult, but reminded him that our son needed both of us to be a team. He apologized and promised to do better, but I told him sorry wasn't enough. I needed to know he was committed to our entire family. When he asked what I wanted from him, I laid out my requirements. I told him I wanted us both to go to counseling together and for him to join a support group for parents of children with autism. I explained that if he was feeling overwhelmed, we needed to find healthy ways to deal with it. He questioned whether all of that was really necessary. I insisted it was, explaining that I couldn't trust him right now and that wasn't the kind of marriage I wanted to be in. He was quiet for a long time, but finally, he agreed. It's been a few weeks now and we've started counseling. He's joined a support group and I can see him making an effort to connect more with our son. It's not perfect and I still have moments of doubt, but it's a start. I don't know what the future holds for us, but I do know one thing for certain. I will always, always fight for my son. He's not a burden. He's a gift. And if my husband can't see that, then maybe we don't have a future together after all. But for now, we're taking it one day at a time, working on being the parents our son deserves. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.